Tonight, we are honored to present the 84th Joseph Emery Lecture on Synthetic Biology, the Technology Engine of the 21st Century. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Pamela Silver. Pam is Professor of Systems Biology at the Harvard Medical School and the Vice Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. She was the founder of Harvard's Department of Systems Biology and served as the first director of the Harvard PhD program in systems biology. Previously, she was professor of biological chemistry and molecular pharmacology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, and assistant professor of molecular biology at Princeton University. Among notable research, Pamela discovered the first nuclear localization sequence and elucidated many of the mechanisms of nuclear localization. In particular, for instance, she characterized the receptor for nuclear localization sequences, discovered the first eukaryotic DNAJ chaperone, and carried out early genome-wide studies of protein interactions within the nucleus. Among practical outcomes of her research, she discovered molecules that block nuclear export and founded Karyopharm Therapeutics to develop their therapeutic potential. Her current projects relate to reprogramming eukaryotic cells, novel therapeutic design strategies, and bioengineering approaches to harnessing energy from sunlight and for capturing carbon to prevent it from being released into the atmosphere. Among many other awards, Pamela was appointed Adams Professor of Biochemistry and Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School, was a March of Dimes Basil O'Connor Research Scholar, and was named one of the top 20 global, global synthetic biology influencers. She earned her BS in chemistry and PhD in biochemistry from the University of California, which one? UCLA. She was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard as a fellow of the American Cancer Society and the Medical Foundation. Please hold questions to the end and join me in welcoming Pam to the podium. Count to 10. I could start now. <laughs> Wait. OK, you come up now. What happened? Just... Oh, let's do that. Oh. oh, that's right. You're on one. That's my problem. Suspense is killing you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new switcher designed to make things a lot easier. Which, you know, we need better it's switches. A, it's my fault. Why don't we just uh, do this? Okay, there's my slide. That's okay, good news. Good. Okay, great. Oops. No, okay, great. Thank you. Are yeah. we stable? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful evening to hear me... Um, try to convince you that uh, biology is the technology that you're all going to be embracing in this century. Um, I uh, like to draw the parallel between the beginning of the last century when synthetic organic chemistry uh, became applicable and uh, brought you things like nylon and uh, other fabrics and other perhaps unpleasant chemicals, but much of your life is based around organic chemistry. And I'll come back to that later, but we believe that biology can do better. And that's what I'm going to convince you of. Now, the Cosmos Club is very clever because um, I'm staying here, and they have a, a great library up on my floor. And right in front of my room is the book, the classic treatise by Linus Pauling, Nature of the Chemical Bond, which was written almost 100 years ago. And I think that maybe they were trying to send me a message or something. <laughs> um, OK, so um, this is who I am. You already heard that. So um, I'm going to do 
a couple things in this talk, um, and I apologize to some of the more hardcore scientists among you, but I'm going to start with an introduction, a little bit of background, a little bit of history about how we got to where we are in terms of making this, making biology into a technology that we call synthetic biology. Then I'm going to tell you about two examples uh, from work that we do that I think has applications to large world problems and so you can get a flavor for what we're doing and then if, in case you fall asleep, wake up at the end because there's going to be a really cool movie. Um, <laughs> all right, but let me begin with lava. Uh, so if any of you, I recently visited the Galapagos and I thought they were really cool and, and many of you have probably been there and you know that they, they form uh, quite suddenly by volcanoes erupting and this is what they look like when they start out, They're, it's just lava. But as you know, over time, um, birds drop seeds, uh, things swim up and they start to look like this, but they are the classic case study for uh, localized evolution because each island is different from the other. Now why am I talking about this? Because I want to segue between evolution and design. So if you're, if you're uh, talking about evolution, things have to work at some level. That is, they have to live if you believe in natural selection. Um, however, and I think I'm allowed to say this here, if you're a human designer, um, much as we think we are as synthetic biologists, you can, you can afford to proceed through intermediates that may not work, and this is sort of the engineering paradigm, but that you should learn from those failures and they should inform the designer of new possibilities. So, so that's sort of the distinction between evolution, which has to work at some level, whereas if you're a designer, and if any of you are computer programmers, you know this well, that, that failure is part of the design process. So the thing about biology is that it actually makes things, it's probably the best chemist there is, and we don't even know, uh, we probably don't even know a fraction of what biology can make. And the more we learn and the more we know, biology will become more and more the technology that we will embrace. So what can biology do? Um, so first of all, it's exquisitely sensitive. And I've drawn comparisons between engineering and biology. Um, I always ask people to guess whose nose this is, and I'll give you a few hints. It's no one in the audience, and it's female, and uh, she used to be, she's pretty famous. Um, <laughs> Although I'm not sure she's, maybe I should change it. I'm not sure she's as famous as she used to be. Anyway, the olfactory system is exquisitely sensitive. It can detect single molecules. Biology can also send and receive signals. You, of course, know about the nervous system, but even within a single cell, a cell can sense a signal from the outside and deliver information and then do something. And it can do that very rapidly. Now, the thing that we appreciate the most, I think, about biology is its modularity. And what do I mean by that? So, historically, the gene was the fundamental modular unit of biology. It's discovered by Mendel, proven by Barbara McClintock and others, that genetic information could be transferred by a single gene. However, uh, with the advent of molecular biology, we started to realize that the modularity of biology extends far beyond the gene. And we can extend that to taking apart genes into different pieces, things that make the genes turn on, things that make them turn off. We can also extend that, this is an example of a protein, and it's a diagram, and it's meant to show that there are these different modules within a protein that biologists often draw in a linear way. But what this means is that I can take out one of these modules and put it in another protein and it will function. It will, it will, so it's, it, it, it uh, lives up to the definition of a functional module. And this has parallels to engineering, of course. Um, so many of you may know that, uh, that the Winchester rifle, right, was uh, the first, uh, Piece, the piece of machinery that had exchangeable parts. This seems normal to us now, except of course if you own an Apple computer, but um, forgetting that, um, <laughs> I think Steve Jobs lost sight of that, ex well, never mind, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, 
but the Winchester rifle was the first example of, of when you, where you could, if part of the gun broke, you could take it to the store and replace it. Now, that may seem trivi sound trivial to you now, but that was really the birth of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so the modularity of biology is something that I have really built part of my career around and appreciate a lot, as do some others in the audience, and it's something that we use in our designs. And then lastly, the reason biology makes for such a cool engineering tool is that it can duplicate. So this computer, as far as I know, can't replicate itself, right? Um, <laughs> hoping not, not this one for sure. But, um, but biology has the beauty of if you can build a biological machine, then it can replicate itself. And then most fundamentally, biology can use sunlight as a source of energy. So it, it's, it, and I'll come back to this later, about how we should be embracing the ability of biology uh, to collect solar energy. Now that said, um, biology knows how to make a lot of cool things that we'd like to make. Uh, if you have a cirrhotic liver, you'd really like to get a new liver, right? So imagine we could grow a liver. Um, Say we could have a leaf where, and I'll actually come back to this later, maybe we could make a leaf that could harness more sunlight. Uh, this is an example of spiders spinning silk. Silk is one of the strongest materials there is. Imagine if we could harness that power and, and engineer silk. So a lot of these ideas um, actually originated um, back over 10 years ago when I had the uh, honor of being invited to join the Synthetic Biology Working Group. And this was a group of bioengineers and computer scientists at MIT who asked the question, why can't biology be easier to engineer? Why can't it be more predictable? Why can't it be more analogous to building a computer chip? Um, and in essence, synthetic biology set out to ask the question, can we make biology easier, more predictable, and faster to engineer? So there are subsets of synthetic biology. You, uh, you will have heard that Craig Venter made a whole genome. We regard that as part of the whole of how do you address this problem. All right. So, um, and I, I want to add as an aside, since this is Washington, um, there's an interesting side story here um, that we, uh, this group and others set out to, of course, raise awareness in the government funding agencies about this idea of trying to build biology in a modular way and to make it cheaper and faster. And the, the organization that, of course, embraced us was DARPA, um, being the... Uh, far-reaching ideas, wacky idea organization that it is. And, and so we set out um, some of the first reports we wrote when we had several meetings where we prepared white papers for the government, for DARPA. Um, and they were all set to fund us. And there are very few of you in the audience that will remember John Poindexter. But unfortunately, <laughs> because of him, um, DARPA's budget was cut. And I'll tell the story later who anyone wants to know, but our, we were, the, it's ended up uh, stalling out synthetic biology for about five to seven years in this country. Now, DARPA's back, and then there's a huge amount of interest in funding it. So that's the good news. All right, so what is life made of, if you're thinking about engineering it? Wait. <laughs> While you're pondering what life is made of, are any of you driving a Toyota <laughs> Corolla? <laughs> Anybody here have a I'll Toyota a Corolla parked in that lot? You're blocking a car and you need to move your car. Oh, the horror. I apologize for this, but now you've all figured out what life is made of. So nah, the I last time I got interrupted was when Caesar Milstein won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so <laughs> I was hoping it would I, be that. I hope, I hope that's a harbinger of uh, a <laughs> call from Stockholm for me. <laughs> all right. So now you all know about life, right? No. Um, all right. So this is a bacterial cell. This is an E. coli. It lives inside you. It lives all over the place. It lives in the sewers. And, and it's sort of the workhorse of, of biologists. Uh, it's, it's one of the simplest organisms. This is its DNA. 
which is its genetic material, and then it's surrounded by membranes. Um, and actually, many of us were taught originally as in biology that this was simply a bag of, of proteins. But in fact, we know it's not, that there's a lot of organization even in this most simple of cells. So it has compartments, it can store information, and it has chemical machinery. So in some ways, it, it has many of the same attributes of the Apple computer, right? Um, so how does it work? So DNA is where the information is stored, and we are very good now at editing this code. So if we think of this as a computer analogy, this is the code, and then that, by editing that code, we can reprogram how uh, the cell works via the, this is the central dogma where DNA produces RNA, which then encodes proteins. This is jiggling slightly, is that normal? Okay, <laughs> just wanted to make sure. All right, um, okay, so, so just keep in mind that this is the goal, we can edit this, and we can program cells to do new things. All right, so most of you won't have a clue what this means, uh, but think of it as a circuit. So this is what we call a genetic circuit. Um, there are two proteins called repressors, they can regulate each other, and depending on which one is on or off, the cells will turn green or not. But who cares about that? Imagine if, like, you're, like this computer, you didn't have to understand what was underneath. All you had to understand was, depending on the input, there would be a certain output. So this is one of the dreams of synthetic biology, that we call this standardization. Could we make biology so standardized that we could build things like this that would always perform the way they should? All right. So in essence, most of what I'm going to talk about, the bacteria is, is this device and it's going to sense things and do things. So if I were to put a black box here, it would be around this bacterial cell. So, have we accomplished what we set out to do? Have we made the engineering of biology more predictable, cheaper, and faster? Well, I would say we've made a lot of progress. So first of all, so if you're an engineer, you might think of the design-build-test cycle. So where are we on that, in that cycle? So first of all, if we're going to design a system, say I want to make a liver, or I want to make a cell that will uh, produce something, produce a biofuel. So we have a ton of raw material to work with now, because every day more and more genomes are sequenced. I think in China they sequence 1,000 people per day or something now, so they're going to in 10 years, everyone in China will have their genome sequenced. But it's not just about people. Uh, we sequence microbes every day. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a, a term, citizen scientists now, where the ability to sequence DNA is becoming so cheap that you could sequence your own, your own bacteria on your skin or whatever you wanted to sequence. Um, and that information, for the most part, is deposited on the internet, and it is freely available. So if I want to build something, I can go to the internet and look at for genes that encode proteins that have certain functions that I might want. Then we come to the design component where I described to you about building genetic circuits, taking advantage of modularity. Now about the build. So it used to be uh, some of us here can remember that it was a pain to make DNA, which, remember, that's the code. Now, um, I can buy a machine from uh, a synthetic genomics and put it on my bench top, and I could estimate that I could synthesize that entire E. coli chromosome in about three months. And it, wouldn't, it would cost me probably less than, probably cost me in the neighborhood of $50,000. That's still too expensive, but that price is dropping extremely quickly. Also, if you want to, if you want to make DNA now, um, you can simply go to a website and order it, and it will be delivered back to you. Most of that DNA, to be clear, is made in China. Um, the, the raw materials for making DNA, the chemicals, I believe are not even made in the United States anymore. They're only made in China. They're called phosphoramidides. 
Uh, the biggest DNA synthesis company is in China, and I think uh, last time I was there, they had upwards of over 600 employees. Um, they took me out to a wacky dinner where um, they, they serve a wine that I, I caution you, please stay away from. Uh, <laughs> no offense, but I really didn't like it. Um, but the point is, DNA is going to essentially become a commodity. Um, and in the next five to 10 years, synthesizing whole genomes synth of small organisms, synthesize, for example, another project in my lab, we are synthesizing a human chromosome. And that, this will all become standard, um, whether you like it or not. Now, the test cycle, does it work? Um, we also have become very good at high throughput analysis. So we can analyze for function very quickly and then feed that back to the design process. So we can run this cycle over and over um, to get to better and better designs. So this is analogous to, this is a paraphrase from Steve. Um, so it's about the customer's experience. So we want to sell that would produce on command, but it should be simple and elegant, right? I don't want to know or you don't want to know what's underneath the hood. Um, and so the, really the outstanding question here is do we know enough to do this? And there are some that say we don't. There are some that say that we're messing with stuff that's too dangerous. And then there are people like me that think this is the future and that we have a responsibility to figure out how to do this. Now there are others that would say what's the big deal? Um, for example, uh, uh, this is Stan Cohen, who did win the Nobel Prize, together with Paul, uh, Paul Berg and Herb Boyer, for uh, the first recombinant DNA. What this meant was that they were able to take a gene from one organism and put it into another. One gene. So this experiment was done in the mid-70s, and it created a lot of commotion. People said, oh my God, you're going to build organisms that aren't going to be safe. What's going to happen? And uh, so actually, the scientists behaved in a very responsible way. And they said, let's have a moratorium on this. Let's all go to Asilomar, which is a beautiful place near Monterey. And let's have a retreat and talk about it. And, but to their credit, they had a very um, enlightening conversation and came up with what we call the biosafety rules, which are what we still abide by today, and there have been essentially very few accidents that you would be concerned with. Um, <laughs> there are some interesting side stories. Um, most of the accidents, by the way, come from people not following the biosafety rules. Um, now, the, so, in, so as I said, this group, uh, including Stan Cohen, not only appreciated the power of the technology, but they also considered the potentials for biohazards and, and wrote a letter to Nature about this um, for the public. So they, were, they really engaged the public in this process. There's a famous hearings in Cambridge, Mass, between the scientists and the city council to convince them that they should allow them to do recombinant DNA at Harvard. Then they didn't, and Jim Watson left, but that, you know, whatever. Um, uh, but, um, so this is a picture from the Asilomar conference. Um, and, I, and so we, it, the scientists asked now that we can rewrite the genetic code, what are we going to say? And this was 1975. I think we know what we want to say. And they knew what they wanted to say also. And I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but the one thing I want to, one point I want to make about this is the thing they didn't discuss was things like bioterrorism. This was not on the map at that time. Whereas now, um, using biology in a negative way is something that is of concern. And perhaps we can discuss this later. Now, the other thing they did that was very strategic, I think, is they made promises to the public about what this technology, recombinant DNA, could deliver as a way of appeasing the public and seeing the positive value of it. And in particular, one of the promises was that, um, that they would make human insulin. Now, uh, 
this is huge for people that develop, uh, so insulin is typically, was typically extracted from pigs. This is huge for people that would develop uh, immune responses to insulin. So if you could make actual human insulin, there wouldn't be an immune response. And also, of course, if you're Jewish, it wasn't very palatable to be, uh, I just realized this the other day, and I, I, uh, I was in Israel and I realized this. Um, anyway, so the, the, they succeeded in doing this. And they succeeded in an amazingly short period of time. And this was the birth of biotech. So companies that you perhaps have heard of, such as Biogen um, and uh, Genentech, they were born from this. And, and this, in, this is now an, in a major industry in this country. Now, where, why are things changed? So now we think of, not, this is one gene, let's think about a whole bunch of genes and what we could do with that. So for example, this is the synthesis, these are all the genes put together in yeast to make um, a, a drug that can be used to treat malaria. Uh, this is taking a pathway that makes the drug from a plant, the wormwood plant, uh, that grows only in a certain part of southern China. It's very expensive, but taking that pathway that they learned from sequencing the plant genome and putting the parts into yeast, which is an industrial organism, to produce this drug, which is called artemisinin. Prior to this, if only this is a drug that could only, you could only afford if you were living in the developed world. The idea here is now it would be cheaper and be able to be distributed to the developing world. And this project unfortunately took maybe eight years. I think it cost, it was originally funded by the Gates Foundation and then it, uh, further funding from other private agencies, the government. Um, and I think the total cost to get this to market, it's being now marketed, I've forgotten which drug company, but. Um, the total cost to getting it to market was several hundred million dollars. And the point is that back to that idea that we want this to be faster and cheaper. So we can't afford to have every project cost that much or take that long. So that, I think, really illustrates the goal of synthetic biology. Now, as I mentioned, there are ethical and social concerns. So I'm telling you we're going to make the engineering of biology easier, simple, cheap. So you could imagine anyone doing it, right? Your, your kids are already doing it in high school, I can tell you that. And um, we run a competition called the iGEM competition. And it's, it originally, originally started for college undergrads to compete to build genetic systems. But now that we have 50 high school teams participating. Uh, so you could imagine even your eight-year-olds, right? Starting to build things in, in your garage. Um, Whereas I played with chemicals, now people are going to play with DNA. Uh, lastly, um, as I mentioned, Craig Venter uh, made a big splash when he claimed to have synthesized uh, a new bacterial genome. To be clear, it wasn't that new. It was a copy of an existing bacterial genome, except I think it had Craig's name in it, um, <laughs> encoded in it. But, but that paper was commented at, on by both the president and the pope. And I don't know about you, but I don't want either one of those peer reviewing my work. Um, so, so I think the idea though is that we are all going to get a lot more comfortable with this, especially hopefully with what I have to show you. Now the other issue is of course petroleum and our dependency on it. And so most of everything, maybe not in this room, but much of what we use is petroleum based uh, when it comes to chemicals, drugs, um, the chemicals that are used to make drugs, and even in the case of things that are used to make inorganic catalysts. So we believe and know that biology can do all of these things. And so imagine a world where we don't have to depend on petroleum, instead we're using biology as the chemist. Uh, recently we, um, for example, the Air Force is very interested in building um, new kinds of inorganic materials uh, to build, say, antenna. Um, also, many of you may appreciate that, for
for example, all these screens we use are developed from rare, rare earth metals that are only mined in China, again, um, and we are probably not going to start mining them, and so can biology provide us with a substitute? All right, um, so here's what I'm gonna talk about in terms of solving real world problems. I'm gonna begin with sustainability and how we can use sunlight to make stuff. And then I'm gonna touch a little bit on health um, and how we can make new kinds of therapeutics. And I want to um, frame this again in the idea that this is a future economy. So, uh, about designing sustainability. So uh, let me begin, um, I'm part of the Harvard University Center for the Environment as well, and uh, my colleague Dan Schrag gave me this slide because he, he doesn't like the use of the word sustainability. Um, and I love this slide because it illustrates that the use of the word sustainable is not even sustainable. So um, here's present day. Uh, uh, and, and the point is out here, if, if we keep going at the same rate, all sentences will just have the word sustainable in them. <laughs> so I leave it to you, the Philosophical Society, to come up with another word for this. Um, and uh, maybe we can take suggestions at the end. Now, about sunlight. Um, so Solar power is one of our greatest natural resources and we use a very small fraction of it. The red here are the so-called sunbelt countries. Um, we are not, let's see, we're up here, so we're not really in it. Um, now, uh, there's a, a big drive to buy up land in a lot of these areas. I was recently at a meeting uh, where um, there was um, one of the, attendees was going to Saudi Arabia uh, to set up their program to cover, you know, Saudi Arabia, it's all sand, so they're gonna cover 80% of the, the land of Saudi Arabia with solar panels in anticipation of how they can replace petroleum when the oil runs out. Um, so, so how can we take advantage of this? Oh, and one, one other aside, Here's Brazil, of course, and um, as many of you may know, they, of course, are the biggest sugarcane producers in the world. And in the, I think it was in the 70s or 80s, um, the bottom fell out of the sugarcane market, and they had a very visionary president who said, "Well, what are we going to do with all this sugarcane? Let's make ethanol and convert from petroleum to ethanol." And um, Volkswagen was the first to make an ethanol-based car. I actually went and worked on that program in Brazil for a while, it was fascinating. People are worried about Brazil because of course they have one of the biggest oil strikes now and whether or not they will sustain their ethanol program. There's another thing interesting is that we are actually the biggest exporters of ethanol in the world. Um, so Brazil does not export a lot of its ethanol. But they, the plan, and I don't know how it's going. So the sugar cane actually grows along here. It doesn't grow. It's not about tearing down the Amazon forest. Um, and they plan to double the sugar cane crop, and that will be enough to provide the world's supply of ethanol. So it does make you rethink the corn issue. All right, so um, if we think about how nature harvests sunlight, obviously there's plants, and there's also algae. So there are algae that are bacteria, and then there are algae that are, that are bigger, that you are probably more familiar with. And algae are actually more efficient at harving, harv um, harvesting sunlight than plants are. And there was a big drive for a while to use algae to make biofuels, but we thought more about using them to uh, make higher value commodities. But let me tell you a little bit about photosynthesis. So one problem with photosynthesis is it's extremely inefficient. Uh, and so why, it's, it's curious why that is. And this is a real example of evolution in action or in inaction. Uh, so photosynthesis, I've heard this number is being revised, but it evolved a really long time ago. And this, is, this curve is, is, or this line is, is an abstraction. But the point is that plants evolved when there was essentially no oxygen on Earth but carbon dioxide was at 20%. So the enzyme that is a, a protein that's responsible 
on all the earth for, for harvest for fixing carbon is a protein called Rubisco. It is the most abundant yet least efficient enzyme on earth. So it has not evolved to do better. Uh, and it evolved at a time when CO2 was very high. Now, of course, uh, you know, asteroid hits the earth, all the dinosaurs die, and uh, the CO2 levels drop, and now we are in an oxygen environment. And the enzyme, curiously, is sensitive to oxygen, um, but it doesn't evolve to do better. And a lot of attempts to make it do better have failed. If anyone's a PhD student here who's thinking of working on making Rubisco better, just don't go there. Um, <laughs> there are better ideas. But that said, these photosynthetic microbes have evolved to do a little bit better in this high oxygen to CO2 environment. So we decided to focus on them. And the question is, what can we do, what can we engineer cells to do with the fixed carbon? So these are the organisms, and if you're not colorblind, um, hopefully you can see red. Can you in the back there see red and green? Thank you. Um, so the red, these are called cyanobacteria. They live out in the ocean or in fresh water. They are responsible for about 50% of the photosynthesis that goes on in the ocean. So, so these guys are really important ecologically also. Uh, so the red is the, uh, machine, reflects the machinery that's responsible for photosynthesis. And the green are the uh, areas within the cell that fix carbon. So we study these a lot, and um, we wondered if we could get them to make stuff other than biofuels. Uh, so what you have to know about these guys is that they, they kind of live out there in the water, and they don't really talk to anyone else very much, whereas E. coli living in your gut are always taking things up and spitting things out. These guys don't really do that. They just need sunlight and CO2 to live and a few minerals. So our goal was to get them to make something and actually transport it out of the cell. So they don't normally do this. So this is where the engineering component comes from. So what are we going to have them make? So as I said, we wanted to make a high-value com commodity. Fuel, by the way, is not a high-value commodity because, of course, we go out and make sure it's cheaper than bottled water and we don't pay taxes on it, at least not very compared to other countries. So what's a high-value commodity? Well, depending on the day of the week, sugar is actually a high-value commodity. So we wanted to know if we could take cyanobacteria, these guys that live in the ocean, and have them make sugar. And just to go back, what that involved was taking another protein from nature so that when they make sugar, they would export it out. So we could, they're sort of acting like a plant. They're fixing CO2, they're taking in sunlight, and they're spewing out sugar. So I'm just going to illustrate for you what that looks like to prove this is real. So this big green glob here is a bacteria that requires sugar for life. But there's no sugar. These, these cells are sitting on a plate, and they're growing, but there's no sugar here. The red cells are those cyanobacteria that we engineered to secrete sugar. So all the sugar that's being supplied here is coming from these bacteria. So the experiment basically works. We can make a high-value commodity, and it can feed something that requires sugar. And in fact, if we calculate how much sugar it's producing, it actually beats sugar cane. Uh, this, is, this is the percent of, of sucrose production by weight, and we can actually show that our bacteria do better than sugar cane. So this is a window into a certain kind of future. Here's another one. Um, and this was, a, this was a project that was innovated by uh, the DOE through the ARPA-E program to use other kinds of bacteria to produce fuels, in this case, and ultimately, perhaps, to produce commodities. And again, it takes advantage of the fact that the bacteria can get their carbon from the outside, but they don't, there are other kinds of bacteria that can use electricity for energy and not sunlight. And so the question was, could we engineer these to either use electricity or light uh, to produce uh, commodities. So this brings me to the last part of this, the story here, 
where we have invented what we call the bionic leaf. Now this is what happens, it's a very unusual event at Harvard when two professors actually talk to each other. <laughs> um, so I met, um, I'll explain what this means as I go, but um, let me first introduce my colleague Dan Nocera. So, so as I said, this, was, this is what happened, Harvard faculty almost never talk to each other, um, at least not, not where I work. Um, and, but I met Dan at a, at a Christmas party, and he had just moved to Harvard. He'd come, been stolen from MIT, and um, he said, oh my God, I've been wanting to talk to you forever, and we meet at a cocktail party. So what Dan had invented is what's called the artificial leaf. So Dan is a chemist. He's an inorganic chemist. He's about as far from biology as you can get. In fact, he... He knows remarkably a lot of biology, but he's really a great chemist. And what he had done, he was very interested in supplying energy to the developing world. And he was interested in hydrogen as a source of clean energy. There was a window of time when the DOE was interested in hydrogen, and then they stopped and decided to only have electric cars. Um, Interestingly, though, the hydrogen car is making a comeback. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine in California that said the Prius, the hydrogen Prius, is being rolled out in California. Then I was talking to my Toyota dealer and asking him about it, and he said, well, would you want to be the person living next door to where they repair the hydrogen Prius? So I hadn't really thought about that. But anyway, Dan, um, what Dan invented was a catalyst that is cheap, relatively inert, and that could do what's called the water splitting reaction. And this is part of what photosynthesis does. So he, he, this is driven by a silicon photovoltaic. It's what's called a cobalt phosphate catalyst. And it splits water. And then there's a second catalyst that forms the hydrogen. So this is Dan's invention, and it was called the artificial leaf. So Dan and I got together and said, well, here, there's a problem here, because if no one wants to use hydrogen, um, is there another way that, is there a way we can store this energy? Um, um, and so we thought one way to store it is through biology. And these organisms that I mentioned earlier, amongst them are organisms that again can fix CO2, but they can also eat hydrogen. So they can live off the hydrogen. One type of bacteria is called Ralstonia. It's actually used in industry quite a bit because it makes the precursors for plastics. So it was already a known organism. It's used by DuPont. Um, so, we, so essentially, we wanted to build a device where the Ralstonia would be using the hydrogen to make stuff. And this is the technical version of it. Here are the electrodes. Um, here's the bacteria. They are engineered, in this case, to make a liquid fuel. And this is what we call a drop-in system. So it's very simple and it's very cheap. We put the electrodes essentially in water together with the bacteria and have them produce fuel. So this worked. It's a cheap, high-yield drop-in system. Um, we are at close to 5% efficiency in terms of collecting energy from light. And this, it may, this is the gold standard. It's comparable to algae. And for comparison, corn is at best 0.2%. If it was doing the best it could, it would be 1.8%. So one of the visions that Dan and I have, and this is very distinct from uh, the way we usually think about energy is could we have localized and personalized production? Could you have this drop-in device distributed in the third world or even have it in your home and have it programmed to make what you want? So that's one future. All right, um, so let me um, conclude then with a little bit about therapeutics and biocomputing. So when I first joined up with that group at MIT, my goal was to build a biological computer, a living computer. So what does that mean? I wanted cells that could sense an event, count forward, and do something. Could they be a therapeutic? Could they make chemicals? Whatever. Now, we built a system, and no humans were used in this experiment, but this was the vision. Um, 
to uh, build a system. This is what the engineer would look at. So there's a signal, it goes away, there's a pulse that turns on, and then there's a signal that remains, and we call that the memory signal. So the vision would be if you had a therapeutic bacteria or a diagnostic bacteria, um, it would go into the animal, and I never thought I'd say this, it would be, we would analyze the fecal material um, <laughs> for whether or not, it would turn color, for example, and tell you whether or not the animal had been exposed or perhaps act as a therapeutic. Now, this program, this project actually derived from a DARPA project where they were interested in um, what I'll call the forensics of microbial societies. And what you need to know is microbes are everywhere. They're on your skin. Oh, and by the way, using that sterilizing stuff is actually bad. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't get rid of your bacteria all the time. Your bacteria are actually good for you. So we live together with bacteria all the time. Uh, it's, it's all throughout our body, with the exception of some organs, and it's in your mouth, your nose, your beard, whatever. Um, so a very uh, visionary person at DARPA named Michael Callahan uh, came up with this program because he had actually been working on Ebola, and he was one of the few individuals who had visited every Ebola outbreak since the first one in 76, and he initiated the program at DARPA to make um, anti-Ebola antibodies, which then, of course, got shut down too soon, right? So this was his second program, which was to build cells that could remember what happened in response to, for example, a pathogen, and count forward, report, and act. There was a side part to this program of systems protection, so how could we prevent or shut down these bacteria at will. Now this has a dual use because these, these bacteria could be used as diagnostics, as I mentioned, so they could diagnose whether you've been exposed to something. They could also act as therapeutics because in your gut, so if any of you have <laughs> suffered from any kind of inflammatory um, bowel disease or Crohn's disease, you appreciate that you are in chronic and so if you had a bacteria that was natural to your gut environment and on demand when it saw inflammation secreted something that could treat that inflammation, that would be great. There are other, other applications. Um, this is a project funded by the Gates Foundation. Enteric dysentery has huge economic and social implications. Uh, this is a healthy gut. This is a diseased gut. And you can see that there's an effect on intelligence, whether when children are born with this disease. So the Gates Foundation is very interested in the re-engineering of the gut. Traveler's diarrhea. Um, I know you really want to hear about this after dinner, but this is a huge cost of the disease part. Um, and I put some numbers up here. Um, for example, when most soldiers go overseas, they suffer from traveler's diarrhea, and that means they're out for up to a week. And this gives you the percent of soldiers that were affected, for example, in the first Iraq war, um, in the Viet even in Vietnam, uh, four times more than malaria, World War II, huge amount. Um, and, and not only are these soldiers uh, sick for a week, many of them never are even so these are soldiers that have gone through training in the camp. So these are, these are applications for engineered gut bacteria. Now we'll go back to the mouse. Um, so we can't work on humans. Um, so that, what we did was to engineer a bacteria that could sense whether or not a mouse had been exposed to a drug, in this case a common antibiotic called cyclin. And you don't have to really appreciate the details of this, but this shows that we can make cells that can be turned on when the animal Toyota's microphones. So. Fire. <laughs> we got no fire yet. <laughs> fire. Okay, 
Can you hear me? I'm sorry if you couldn't hear me before. Someone should have spoken up. Um, okay, so these animals, when they, uh, again, when we check out their fecal matter, we can simply put them on a, a petri plate here, and whether they turn color or not tells us whether or not the animal was exposed to tetracycline, in this case, the drug. So this worked. So what this means is that we can move on and build those diagnostics, which is essentially what I just told, showed you, and also start to build therapeutics. And I'm going to show you one movie where these are the good bacteria and the green guys are the bad bacteria. And if you watch, the good bacteria are going to grow and they're secreting something that is going to stop the green bacteria from growing. And you can see the, the black guys are growing and the green guys stop growing. So this, once we put this all together, we will have our therapeutic and our biological computer. And we are close to doing that. And in fact, here's an example of the counter. Um, we have a cell that every time it divides, it contains a signal in one cell and not in the other. And so we can count the number of times the cells have divided. And here's a picture of that. So you can see this particle segregating every time the cells divide. Um, and it's a faithful number, counter of the number of cell divisions. And again, we can put this in the mouse and it will count the number of times the bacteria divides as it passes through the mouse. It actually turns out to be quite a, a, a very small number of generations as it passes through. And then we can go bigger. Um, so we imagine, um, what if we could reboot the entire gut? And this again is a DARPA funded project where we are striving to put together um, five known gut bacteria that can all talk to each other. And if they sense a signal coming in, we can shut them off at will. We also have the ability to grow gut cells in a, on a chip. This is called the gut on a chip and we can flow things through it. This was invented at the Wies Institute. We can isolate bacteria viruses that are specific for each different kind of bacteria, and we can package them into material that will allow the, the a phage is a virus, uh, that will allow them to pass through the stomach, and when they reach the gut, dissolve, and then attack certain bacteria. So again, I'm sort of just giving you a vision of the future, and, um, we imagine synthetic probiotics. And interestingly, chicken farmers. Um, I never thought I'd also be talking to chicken farmers. So it turns out chickens have a huge problem with inflammatory disease. And also, of course, you want to reduce the amount of antibiotics that are used. And so chicken farmers are actually quite interested in using our bacteria to diagnose whether their chickens have inflammation or not. I know that. Good thing we didn't have chicken for dinner, right? Um, Okay, so on to the future. So I've shown you that we can create things that work in the real world. I showed you the bacteria that will work in animals. Uh, we can make things that will work in the environment, and we can begin to transform the chemical industry. But there's more, and this is the end. So um, one thing about living in are working in Boston is that there's so much there. Um, your graduate students often tend to wander. And um, my students in particular tend to wander over to MIT where they get involved with the Media Lab. And in doing so, we met Neri Oxman. And Neri is an awesome designer. Uh, she uses what's called 3D printing to, for example, design clothes. This was on the Paris runways. And we decided, we came up with the idea of what if we could make clothes that were photosynthetic. <laughs> so I hope you're bringing it all together now. I told you about we could engineer the photosynthetic bacteria. We can get them to make stuff. Can we interface this with Neri's designs? And could you have a living piece or a piece of clothing that would provide a source of energy to your body? All right, so um, I'm going to play you. So this is a project that is very much a collabor collaboration between people in my lab and, uh, in particular, Will Patrick and in Neri's lab. And they are letting me show this 
prior to the TED talk, so you have to, you can't take this video away, so shut down all your electronic materials. Um, and I'm just going to play you a few clips. So the project is called Mashtari. And I guess the sound isn't working. Oh, yes, it's great. So here are bacteria growing. So these are the bacteria that we hope to put inside of the wearable. So the wearable is made from 3D printed material and it will contain 60 meters of channels which are filled with living bacteria. Sounds yummy, right? Um, and this next video should show you what that's the beginning. Okay, so this will give you appreciation for what biology really looks like. So these are these gr bacteria growing. They're actually green. They're really beautiful. Um, and we sample them. And this is actually them embedded into one of those, uh, some of this material. And here they are growing. And you can see, uh, again, the red and the green as they divide. Now about the design. And as I said, this is really Neri's work. Um, so they wanted to 3D print um, a, a piece of clothing onto a human. So this just shows you how that process proceeds. This is the design process. And they, this is, for 3D printing, this is, this is about as complicated as it can get. Um, so these are some of the things they've made. And then lastly, can we put, are they transparent enough and can we put the bacteria inside them? So this shows you that it's, the light can get in. There's a, a fluorescent material inside. And so you can see the, by the way, this model is really small. <laughs> In case you were wondering if you could have one of your own, it won't fit on me. And then this lastly is where we are now, is putting the cyanobacteria into the wearable. Now, some of you may realize that this is one step closer to also having a photobioreactor, which is also one of the big challenges that we face with using sunlight. So, um, that finished because I like them. I think they wrote the music as well. And then let me close just with, after all of that, um, what do you want to build? Um, what's your, what are your ideas? And we want a future where you, where you or your children can ask, what do I want to build? And then you can actually be able to build it. So um, these are my collaborators over the years. Uh, just a subset of them who contributed to this work, and a shout out to uh, that original group at MIT who helped me get started, and I was sort of the token biologist amongst a bunch of computer scientists and bioengineers. Uh, in particular, these are the people that uh, either contributed to some of the ideas or directly to the work, and as I mentioned, Neri at, and Stratasys is the company that uh, does the 3D printing. They're an Israeli company. And all of my wonderful supporters, and I actually left off the Gates Foundation. So I will finish there. Thank you. So. We have time for questions. Um, there are microphone runners around the room. Where are you? They're going to look and see who raised their hands to ask a question and bring you a microphone. And when they bring the microphone to you, would you please stand up, uh, state your name, tell us whether you're a member or a guest. No penalty for not being a member until later. And ask a question, no speeches, please. So put your hands up. OK, how about we'll start with Ruth? And then uh, let's go to Jerry back there. This is, there's a wonderful talk. This isn't a question. For truth in packaging, while the Remington rifles are supposedly interchangeable, someone did a study once and got the Remington Rifle Club to bring their rifles in and took them apart, numbered them, and tried to reassemble them, and they didn't fit. They had to yeah, file them I down know. one by one. That was the early days. <laughs> that was kind of like the beginning of Apple also. Jerry back there. 
Thank you. Larry, I've got one. Where, I'm sorry, where? Jerry. Are you have a oh. question, Jerry? Who's, somebody has the mic. Oh. Not me. Oh. Not you? Oh. There's somebody Nobody. right there, right there. I guess I'll go then. Um, Isaac Schomer, I am a member. Uh, my question is in regards to um, bacteria that live in radioactive environments. And I'm wondering if there have been any efforts to engineer them so they can get their energy from the radioactive decay. Funny you should mention that. Um, so what he refers, he ha refers to bacteria that have been recovered from nuclear reactors. And um, it's funny you should mention that because they're radiation resistant. And we are actually working on them in our laboratory because um, they may play a big role ultimately in space travel and things like that. So yes, um, we are making efforts to engineer them. Yes. <laughs> Let him ask a question, then you can go, Carl. Okay. I, I, it, it occurs to me that you might be in a position to approve of a proposition that by redefining the number of uh, items on a chip in specifying Moore's law into gadgets that actually do something, you have just proposed an extension of Moore's law, perhaps a century into the future instead mm -hmm. of a decade. How do you feel about that proposition? I feel really good about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that that's a feature of biology, in essence, what you're saying, is that biology probably, we don't even know the capacity of biology to encode information. We don't know all the information. We're still learning that. And, and to, be on, to be fair, there's still a lot of basic research to be done to figure this out, but every year there's something new about how the code is interpreted. And so I think biology is going to way beat out Moore's Law. My name is John Birch. Uh, I'm a guest. I had a question about uh, one of the fears about uh, engineered organisms is uh, this, similar to that of invasives. Uh, and if you've ever explored the option or technologies involved in uh, sort of an automatic apoptosis mm -hmm. for organisms that right. escape the controlled environment of their intended right. target. Right, yes. And that was sort of the implication in that slide I had where I didn't address systems protection. We call those kill switches. And they're pretty easy to make, actually. Um, now, of course, you really, the question is how good is the switch? So you really want it to be 100%. And I'm going to take this opportunity to address another concern that dovetails on what you said, and that's horizontal gene transfer. And what that means is we've got this engineered organism out there, and it might transfer its DNA to the native organisms. And what's nice about the fact that we can now synthesize genomes is we can synthesize genomes that will prevent horizontal gene transfer. So I think that problem is going to be solved. <coughs> uh, okay. I don't know who's calling on who here. <laughs> Hi, Carl Merrill, a member of the society. <coughs> I was intrigued with the, the uh, cloth or the material that could carry out photosynthesis, but it reminded me when I started at NIH back in the early, in the 60s, uh, there was a fellow, Chuck Greenblatt and I, we got interested in, in hydra. And hydra can either be, uh, not have algae growing intracellular yeah, or yeah. not. <laughs> and, and we found that you could infect the non-green hydra with, with the infectious algae, mm -hmm. which always worried me about swimming in pools with, <laughs> with algae. But I just wondered if you could, I mean, if we all became green, maybe we wouldn't need that clothing. Actually, it's funny you should mention this because we did that experiment we actually published this, um, where we took the sugar-making cyanobacteria because we thought they're essentially artificial chloroplasts. Uh, what I didn't mention is those bacteria are the historical uh, precursor of the chloroplast in plants, which makes energy in plants. So we thought maybe we could put them inside 
a cell and, and they would support life in the cell. So we actually did that experiment. We did it in two ways. We put it inside worms and the worms grew up and every worm, the and worms grew, they didn't care. And, and every cell had a, a green guy in it. They didn't survive. The trouble is they're not making enough sugar to support life. We also could do it with macrophages, but sugar's a bad choice for that to, as a test case for that experiment. But I'll tell you one interesting side story. Well, so the control for that experiment was to do the same thing with plain vanilla E. coli. And in every case, the cells don't mind the cyanobacteria, but they die when you put E. coli in them. So what I think is because cyanobacteria, you know, they're free swimming, like you said, they're just out there, that we should be thinking more about using them for some of these therapeutic things because I think they may not elicit an immune response. So I think maybe we're thinking along the same lines here. Yes, my name is Timothy Thomas. I'm a member of the society. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, I have two very different questions. I don't know which one to ask. But the first concerns whether or not safety rules that work well at Harvard and MIT and in academic environments will work in high schools, in hostile countries, in billionaires. Um, you may say, we'll do it this way, but they'll say, screw it, let's do it that way. And I wonder how you can write rules that are followable by uh, potential. And the other question, completely different, concerns fecal transplant and whether you, whether you think this is a viable current technology and whether your technology can enhance that. Okay, so I'll, the, the second one's easy. Um, I, I assume most of you know about fecal transplant. Can't I can't hear you. It should be on, just speak up. Speak into it. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, uh, fecal transplant has gotten a lot of press, and I think there's some really nice medical examples of it helping diabetics. The downside of fecal transplant is I think you have to take 17 pills a day or something. It's really disgusting. Um, but I do know people who have Crohn's disease that are, would like to try it. So in that context, I think, no pun intended, that our approach would be more palatable than, than um, having to take 17 pills of poop a day. Okay, your second question, which is the big one. Um, let me begin with high schools, because that's easy. So we run, as I said, a competition where, we, where high school students can participate. We will not allow them to participate in the competition unless they abide by the biosafety guidelines. Well, that's easy. Um, with regard to, you're really talking about misuse. Um, so first of all, there is a bioterrorism treaty. Now I can't, and, and as you know, we do not, we do not do that, we do not uh, make organisms in this country anymore that are, so I'm told. We don't make any that are evil. Um, that said, um, it's like anything, uh, any technology can be subject to misuse, right? And how do you prevent that? And uh, you can do that through economics. You can do that through ac accessibility. And as I pointed out, we're in a bit of an awkward position here because China is sitting on a lot of this technology. And we, in this country, have, we were a little slow on appreciating this. The Europeans have uh, organized around synthetic biology very aggressively, as has China. We're a little late to the, the, on this. Um, so. Uh, and in terms of misuse, you, you can't help but read about the Chinese experiment with engineering uh, embryos, human embryos. And I've been to China. This has been going on there for a long time. This is not news to people in the scientific community. So where you draw those ethical lines and practical lines is, I think that's where the public the, the citizens, and this is another reason why I really feel strongly that people need to be better educated in science. So you can, I want you all to participate in the discussion. And there's, there's a, I'm sorry to go on about this, but just one last thing. There's, there's some who say we are training too many science PhDs in this country. And my response to that, and, and that one of those people happens to be my chair, so I'm going to get in trouble for this, but, um, uh, but, 
I, my response is, how can you ever train too many scientists? I would like to see a president who's a scientist. I would like my senator to be a scientist. So I don't see how we can ever say we're training too many scientists. And, and that goes to your question. We need people that can understand this. Question over here. Uh, Ron Summers, I'm a member of the society. So I have a question about the tools of synthetic biology. Is it sort of like the tools of an electrical engineer where you have a catalog of components and you can put them together to, to make a, a structure? And how big is that catalog and how, at what rate is it expanding? Right, so, so this idea, we call it the registry. Um, and that's the, par the parallel to building a computer chip is to have well-characterized parts that you can put together in a predictable way. And this was one of the original dreams of synthetic biology. So one thing that the iGEM competition does is we, the students all generate parts. So there's a, if you go to iGEM.org, there's a huge, I don't know how many parts are in there. What I can tell you, though, is how many of them actually are standardized. And this is, this is the bottleneck. Um, so you can make lots of parts. Uh, there, are, there are registries, there's, regist there's a, there are different countries are maintaining registries. But how do you make standards? If, if you're in electrical engineering, you have standards. What are the standards in biology? If I want to use this part, what do I need to know about it? And I think that's where the struggle is. And there's also a struggle where there are people coming at this purely from an engineering point of view, which is great, but they don't know any biology. And so when they talk about the standards, they are not necessarily understanding the biology behind it. So we really need to come together as a community. Uh, I guess we'll have one last question, but not a speech. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Rudy Krutar. I am a member of the society. Um, I have two issues that seem to violate your chronology. The first is the first woman scientist actually designed wearable biologic clothing. That was, of course, Eve with her fig leaves. <laughs> <laughs> the second, you, you said that, uh, that this biotechnology began in the 70s. On the day that men first walked on the moon, I gave a speech at an international conference on uh, medical and biological engineering on a program I wrote that analyzed the, the folding structure of transfer RNA molecules given the uh, sequence, the uh, basic sequence. And we knew the base sequences of seven uh, transfer RNA molecules at the time. and. Uh, and we correctly, we correctly did it. Now the question is, does that make me a pioneer in your field? Sure, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. As Linus Pauling was as well. So thank you, Pam. Thank